A lot of talk in recent days that the White House is considering restarting some sort of new policy regarding family separation. At the end of that press availability with Egyptian President el-Sisi, in the chaos of the White House staff trying to shoo the press out of the Oval Office, the president addressed that and said he's not going to do that. Listen here. We're not looking to do that, no. We're not looking to do that, no. Thank you very much. But it does make, it brings a lot more people to the border. When you don't do it, it brings a lot more people to the border. We are not looking to do it. But President Obama had the law. We changed the law. Now, the president there saying that President Obama f separated families. He stopped it, although the zero tolerance policy did reinitiate it. But the president said not looking to do it. What they were considering is, is the so-called binary choice, uh, which was agreed to in a joint court filing by the Department of Justice and the ACLU last July. It would give uh, parents who are being detained the choice of whether or not to have their child stay with them in detention or at the end of 20 days voluntarily separate from their child and allow their child to go stay with either a relative in the United States or a licensed uh, program in the U.S., but it would have, and this is the court filing right here, it would have given parents the choice of doing that. Now, in terms of DHS, uh, when Kirsten Nielsen leaves at the close of business uh, tomorrow, there's going to be a lot more people who are on the way out the door with her because she clearly has got her own staff policy and communications. They will likely leave. Uh, Democrats, meantime, challenging the appointment of the man on the right you see there, Kevin McAleenan, saying in a letter uh, from the uh, Homeland Security Chairman Benny Thompson to President Trump that the law does not allow McAleenan to step into that job. Benny Thompson writing, the law of succession at the department is clear. The undersecretary for management shall serve as the acting secretary if the secretary and deputy secretary are unavailable. The current undersecretary for management is Claire Grady, who's also serving as the acting deputy secretary. So it's pretty clear that she is going to have to be removed from her position position in an order for McAleenan to take over. Of course, all of the political appointees serve at the pleasure of the president. They know what they're getting into and they take these jobs. Grady, by the way, has held a number of positions across government in the Department of Defense and the Coast Guard. She received a presidential rank award in 2010. So. I assume that she will have no problem finding another job. Another big change at DHS, the U.S. Secret Service Director Randolph Tex Alice is leaving at the end of April. He will be replaced by the man on the right, James Murray, who is the, currently the head of protective operations. Uh, U.S. Secret Service staff, I'm told, were shocked to hear that Alice is leaving. He came over from Customs and Border Protection a couple of years ago. Murray's been with the service for 23 years. Alice was seen as something of an outsider, which is what the president was looking for when he appointed him. Uh, Murray is uh, really a person who's risen through the ranks of, uh, of the Secret Service. And rumors of a lot more changes as well. Stephen Miller, the president's chief domestic policy advisor, who was given full authority over immigration policy last week, wants to restructure management throughout DHS to take a tougher stance on immigration. Reports uh, that the head of the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, Lee Francis Cisna, may be next to go, along with his policy deputy, possibly the chief counsel, Senator Charles Grassley of Iowa, warning the White House uh, not to make any more changes at DHS. Listen here. I'm concentrating on those two, uh, trying to save a good intellectual basis for his uh, immigration policy. So talking there again about the head of uh, the United States uh, Customs and uh, sorry, Citizenship and Immigration Service, as well as the policy deputy. Uh, Grassley said that the president really is, by making all of these changes, pulling the rug out from underneath the feet of the people who are trying to support him. Harris? Well, I'm just real quickly curious to know what the White House says from the criticism that comes uh, at this point that you're maybe looking at some open positions that are pretty far up the food chain. What is the response? Yeah, you know, I think the president uh, is doing what he thinks is best uh, for the nation. And I'm sure that he appreciates the difference of opinion, uh, whether it be within the White House or in Congress. Uh, but the president's going to do what the president wants to do. You should know that by now, Harris. And the right to do it as well is what we know. John Roberts, thank you very much. I think it's also important to remember that all he has given and all he undertook to give in that letter was the bottom line conclusion. So in a lot of the commentary, it's erroneously been described as his summary of, of Mueller's report. It's not a summary. Um, basically, it's, you know, the Yankees, played, the bank, Yankees played last night and they lost five to four. 
and you got the you got the final score. He didn't give you the details of the game. Um, to describe it otherwise is just inaccurate. And it, you know, if you remember the number of times that uh, Rod Rosenstein, the the deputy attorney general, testified, whether it was before the House uh, committees that were investigating, well, both both doing oversight on the Justice Department and investigating the investigation, mm -hmm. uh, and the Senate committees, they've asked him a million questions over the last couple of years about Mueller's report and, you know, the progress of the investigation and so on. So obviously, they were up to speed on what was going on in the investigation. And the other thing is, whatever you think of the people that that uh, Mueller had on his staff, mm -hmm. and it, uh, as far as the ideology and the activism of them, I'm not a big fan of a number of them, but in terms of their skill, their skill is indisputable. And, uh, you know, if they gave the attorney general a 400-page report, they laid it out in a way that it would have been very easy to see instantly what the Just real conclusions quick, were. Before we move on, they said they're gonna, he's going to color code the redactions right. so that you know which of those four categories they come from. He wants to release it to the public first, then go over to Congress and sit and speak to them about each of the redactions and what they're about and what he can reveal. Right. Does that make sense and will it satisfy critics? I think, well, look, I, I think if they hold back one comma, critics are never going to be satisfied. And if he gave them every comma, then it would be the nefarious stuff is in the underlying information that they didn't disclose. Great right? point. So mm -hmm. if you're going to, if you're going to, if this is a political showbiz thing, then no, people are not going to be satisfied. But I think in the first instance, you know, look, he got a 400-page report at about 5 o'clock on a Friday. By 3 o'clock on Sunday, we had the, the bottom line conclusions, which was something of a feat because the attorney general himself had to draw one of the conclusions, right? Mueller didn't decide the obstruction question. Barr had to decide that himself. Now, with a three to 400-page report, in what in Washington time is, is pretty short order, we're going to get the report. Well, isn't that true? And, and it's going to have categorized excisions that he says, I'll explain to you what the excisions are, and I'll engage with Congress on whether we can give any more information that will satisfy them. And if I could just make one more point, this reminds me a lot of classified information litigations where things get withheld all the time. Right. One of, the, one of the things it says in classified information law for disclosure purposes is if you can't give the classified information, the government can replace that with a summary of what it says or what it proves. So you don't get the stuff that's classified or the methods and sources, but at but least you, you get a narrative get of what it means. Bottom line again, so which is that, what you're talking about. That's exactly such useful right. language. Right. I want to quickly follow up with a couple of things. One, uh, I have not substantively heard a compelling talk about the difference between an independent and a special counsel, and I think it's important. Yep. Because having interviewed Ken Starr, most recently we talked about why there were those salacious details and that 11-point possibility ground for impeachment that went on to be grounds for impeaching Bill Clinton. Why we saw so much of that stuff with, that was like a radioactive in terms of right. how explicit it was. And he explained his job was different. He was an independent counsel. And when the law changed or expired on us having as a nation independent counsels in the late 1990s, 1999 I think to be exact, then we got a special counsel who it was by design would not include those 6C category grand jury testimony. Now there are four different lanes that William Barr laid out today in terms of where he will redact, but that is the one that Jerry Nadler is focused on because that grand jury testimony is what could keep it redacted no matter what you do with those three other lanes. What do you say about that? Well, a couple of things. I think, you know, Judge Starr is absolutely right. His statutory mandate, he was kind of a constitutional anomaly because in a way he's reporting to the Justice Department and reporting to the Congress. When the law lapsed, the special counsel is just a Justice Department prosecutor. Exactly. He's in the executive branch pipeline. He's it's, an employee, basically. Top of the that, food chain, but... Yeah, but it's also, it's importantly, his job is to ferret out crime, not to determine whether there are high, high crimes and misdemeanors, which mm -hmm. is a different Impeach standard. Time. So there's that. The other thing is the, the 6E stuff, the grand jury inquiry and, and how much grand jury stuff is in the report. We had a big decision from the D.C. Circuit at the end of last week. 
which says basically that judges or, or the Justice Department and everyone else is stuck with what the exemptions are in Rule 60, the narrow exceptions to privacy. Mm -hmm. And disclosure to Congress is not in that. Mm -hmm. But I, I think we ought to bear in mind uh, an interview that, uh, that uh, John Dowd, who was one of um, President Trump's, I think, the second set of lawyers, but he knows a lot about the investigation. He gave a very interesting interview to Byron York about a week or so ago, in which he suggests, you know, the stuff that people are really interested in is more than likely going to be the White House personnel and the White House documents that were handed over to Mueller. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, there are privilege issues with that, but they were not grand jury witnesses. They